In the late 1930s, wow, I was on. Late 1930s, uh, farmers all across the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles were faced with a, a very difficult decision. And the decision was to either take the, what was rain, remaining of their wheat seed and to sow it into their pastures, or they could take that wheat and feed their family. A little bit of backstory, many of these farmers had left their life in the east. They'd come out to the plains in search of, I'm not sure they were looking for fortunes, but making a new and better life for them and their family. And so they began farming in the the panhandles, Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, You may have heard this period was a very difficult one if you were going to start a farm. It's what's known as figuratively known as the Dust Bowl, uh, uh, kind of overcultivation of the soil, extreme drought that lasted for years, had left all of these families in very desperate situations. So they had to make a decision. Do I take what little grain I have left, feed my family, abandon my farm, give up on my dreams, or do we take what we have in our hands, which we could eat and enjoy, and sow it into the field, Take those seeds and plant them and hope for rain. Prior years said it wasn't going to happen. Prior years said it wasn't worth the sacrifice. But thankfully, many of those farmers, even in the midst of really dire circumstances, they took what, left of, what was left of their wheat seed and they sowed it into their field. And in 1939, the rains came And the crop sprouted, and the harvest was ultimately bountiful. By sowing their seed, uh, they were able to feed their families and save their farms. And for many of them, they were able to secure their future and continue their dream uh, of farming. You see, the thing about harvesting is what we all like, right? I mean, that's what we all look forward to in our life, to go out and to reap and to enjoy the things that we look forward to. As you've thought about this year, there are likely many things that you want to see happen in your life, a harvest that you would love to reap, results that you would love to see. Uh, And and many of us at this time of the year, we're we're thinking about, what am I going to invest in? Uh, But I want to tell you on the front end that you should be careful, not that it's bad to make resolutions or think about your future, uh, but you should be careful to understand that a harvest is always preceded by sowing, and sowing always involves risk. You take what you have in your hands. Something that might even be dear to you, as precious as your time or your treasure, and you have to sow it into the fields. Now, the good news is that uh, oftentimes when we, when we sow seed, it can, retu- it can produce an extraordinary harvest, 30 or 60 or 100 times even what was sown. And so today and over the next several weeks in this series called Growing Together, I'm going to ask you to risk your life on the kingdom of God. To put your time and your talents and your treasure at risk. And we do so because we want to see a harvest. I'm going to ask you to sow your time. All of the gifts that God may have given to you. Your treasure, your stuff. Into the kingdom of God. To to let loose of those things. To sow them and to trust God to bring an extraordinary return in your life. Specifically today, what I want to speak to you about in this this one particular sermon, week one, is sowing your life into the local church. Now, I'm not going to pretend like this is the most um, exciting topic you've ever heard in your lives. Most of you didn't get up and think, and I can't wait to hear about the importance of church membership. Like, I've just really felt that in my life, and I'm really eager uh, to pursue such a thing. Um, Some of you may be sitting here wondering why church membership would even matter. Why would it be important at all for our lives? I promise I'm going to do my best to answer those questions. Uh, But before we get too far into it today, I want to give you uh, the best working definition of of, of a church member, what it means to be a member that I could find. Uh, I need to give credit to John MacArthur. I stole this from him word for word. He's got a really helpful article, by the way, that I've referenced uh, throughout this sermon um, that I think you should read if you get an opportunity. So Google MacArthur church membership. There will be an abundance of resources. But this is his definition. It's going to be on the screens. To become a member of a church is to formally commit oneself to an identifiable, 
local body of believers who have joined together to receive instruction from God's Word, to serve and to edify one another through the proper use of spiritual gifts, to participate together in the ordinances, and to make disciples of the lost. And so there are a few things that are going to happen in any given local church. We're going to baptize, and we're going to enjoy the Lord's Supper together. We're going to use our gifts to build one another up. We are going to sit under the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, and we're going to seek to make disciples both of one another and of those who are not yet a part of us. In addition, uh, he adds here, when one becomes a member of a church, he submits himself to the care and authority of the body of believers who are led by biblically qualified elders that God has placed in that assembly. Now again, if you're not just like, man, I'm feeling that. I, I'm so ready. Like, sign me up. I'm ready to be a church member. Or, or if you still don't see even the importance or why it matters, I'm going to spend the rest of the day giving you four reasons why you should become a member of this or another local church. Before we jump into that, I, I want to show you what I think is one of the most beautiful passages in any of Paul's epistles. He doesn't tend to be uh, all that... Uh, artsy, you know, poetic in the way that he describes things. But he writes a letter to the church at Philippi that you can just see is filled with his emotion and his love for the people there in Philippi. You see, the Apostle Paul had been there to preach the gospel first in that city. Um, he was there when the first people had trusted in Jesus Christ. He might, may have even baptized some of the people there. But he'd also suffered alongside the people at Philippi. While he was there, he was arrested he was beaten, and he was thrown in jail. Paul had suffered alongside these believers, and now he's separated from them for a time, and he writes them this letter to encourage them. And here's what he says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And if he didn't say, say anything else, there would be plenty to challenge you with uh, in today's message. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're reminded of what Jesus did for us. Jesus laid down his life for us. Not that we would live the rest of our days in sin and unbelief, but that we might come to know God and trust God and enjoy the abundant life that's available in Him. And so here it is. He's just going to lay it out there for His friends, the people that He loves, this church that He's uh, helped start. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. But then He's going to show them what that would look like for the people at Philippi. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or I'm absent, whether I get to see it with my own eyes or I just hear the reports that come back to me, that I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. What does it look like to live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? To gather with a local group of believers a body of believers in the church. Stand firm together in one spirit. Strive side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. The Apostle Paul is going to write a little bit later in this letter that he knew that the church at Philippi was going to face some of the same things that he had faced there for proclaiming the gospel. For daring to believe in Jesus and proclaim him, Paul had suffered greatly. Church, we're not there. I mean, we're not facing such difficulty, but I will tell you that in our culture and in our nation, things are becoming more difficult. We would be naive uh, to, to think that somehow things are going to always exist as they have for most of us growing up, where it's just free and easy and everyone validates the, the beliefs of Scripture and our ideas. It's simply not true. I believe that in the coming days, it's going to become increasingly difficult to live open lives as believers without facing some level of persecution. And I think we should hear the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to those in Philippi whom he loves. And I want to, I want to encourage you to live lives worthy of the gospel you see, you've received. Not, not standing on your own. And not being some disconnected person out there just kind of going through life making your own way. But rather that you've joined together in one spirit. 
having one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What he assumes on the front end is that those believers at Philippi who are going to face persecution, they're not going to make it alone. And what he wants to see are believers who would commit themselves to one another. That when one of them endures suffering or hardship or difficulty, that they don't endure it alone, but rather they lock arms together. Say, we're going we're to follow Jesus Christ. We're going to stand firm for the faith of the gospel. And we're going to do it together. As we seek, as Christians, as believers, people who call ourselves disciples, to live lives worthy of the gospel, we need to know that we cannot do that alone, but rather we do it alongside a local group of believers who are going to suffer the things we're going to suffer, they're going to experience some of the things that we experience, who are going to walk with us through those difficult days. Anybody here ever have the privilege of coaching t-ball? To be honest with you, it, it was one of the, the great joys of my life, although I complained a lot. I'll be honest. I coached with Corey Woods. Um, he could attest. There are some difficult moments when you're coaching t-ball. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful because you take a group of kids who have, they've never played a, a, like a game together in their lives, right? It's always kind of been unstructured play, what I want to do at this moment. And you start trying to somehow corral them together as a team. And they show up, they usually don't know their coach or one another or anything about the game. Uh, and, and here you have this new team of kids and, and they kind of do what they've been doing. I mean, in your first practice, somebody hits the ball and everybody goes and chases it. It's like, oh, we're playing tag in the outfield, right? I mean, there's just uh, funny things that go on. And then, you know, the first game when someone gets a hit and they run to the pitcher's mound instead of first base or, you know, the ball rolls right next to the kid who's sitting in the outfield picking clover. And man, it's like, it's really a joy to watch those kids who didn't know anything and they start to learn a little bit about the game. They're, they never play it with excellence. Like, it's not happening unless you're on one of those one of those teams, you know, the people whose kids are going to get scholarships and all that, and they're five, and they're, they're like, that's not City League ball, it's not what we experience. But it was a real joy to watch them just take a step, like, and learn a little bit, you know, and even when they ran to the wrong base, or they couldn't make the throw, or really very few things went right, it was still like the cutest daggum thing to watch on any given night, like, I think everyone should go watch T-ball. And as cute as T-ball is, and those kids, like, not knowing what's going on and, you know, watching them make pretty profound mistakes and completely misunderstanding the games. As cute as it is for a bunch of young people, and that is a terrible approach to accomplish anything meaningful with our lives. A bunch of disconnected kids who don't know why they're out there or what they're doing, right? They just kind of come together when their parents drop them off and they attempt to play a game that they don't really understand. As kindly as I can say this, I believe that's how many people approach church. We have been called to make disciples. Jesus Christ gave his life that people might find life in him, that they wouldn't perish and spend eternity separated from him in hell, but rather that they might know the living God and have their lives transformed by the power of the gospel and be set free from sin and addiction and brokenness, that they could find healing in him and hope for their future. And yet many of us, we approach church with about the same level of sincerity as the five-year-olds out there on the ball field. If I can make it, I'm going to make it. If I feel like participating, I participate. We're not working on the fundamentals at home. We're not growing in our own abilities and then coming together to play well as a team with the rest of the church. We like unstructured play. No one's going to tell me what to do or when to do it. I'm going to kind of go my own way, believe what I want to believe, think what I want to think. Paul says, man, live lives that are worthy of the gospel that you've received. And I hope today that you can feel the weight of the gospel, that Jesus Christ has something more for you. I believe he has something more for us as a body, and he certainly has more for our community as we as the church of Jesus Christ come together and we begin to function as the church of Jesus Christ was attended, we commit ourselves to Jesus and to one another, standing firm together in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So I'm going to give you four reasons why I believe you should join this or 
another local church. And that first reason is this. First reason I would point you to is the example of the early church. Those earliest believers that you're going to read about in Acts, when Peter preached the gospel on Pentecost and people heard the good news of Jesus Christ, they saw the power of the Spirit manifested. What they did when they responded in faith to the gospel was they, they went public with that. They were baptized and they began to join together as the local church and they were sharing the things that they had in common and gathering and listening to the apostles teach. Look here in Acts chapter 2 verses 41 through 42. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they devoted themselves. That word devoted is really significant. That means they intentionally chose to do something, not once and not twice, but over and over and over. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. If you skip down to verses 46 and 47, and day by day. After day, after day, after day, they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What we see in the example of the early church, it began in Jerusalem, and this carried true, or this rang true no matter where the gospel went. Early believers gathered together to hear the word, devoted themselves to one another, meeting together house to house and place to place. They were caring for one another and serving one another. It just happened. From the earliest of believers, even without a particular verse, that tells us, thou shalt join a local church. This is what the earliest of believers committed their life to. Now, some people raise an objection, and they say, you know, I don't don't see church membership anywhere in the Bible. And I'll grant that. There isn't a a passage and verse that I can point you to that says, yeah, join a church, do that thing. You know, that's there. You need to to do that. Here's, Here's the specific line, the text that tells you in the Bible you should. But much like the word Trinity, which describes God, God existing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The word Trinity is nowhere specifically laid out in Scripture. We don't find the word in the Bible. We see the Trinitarian nature of God described from the front to the back of the Scriptures. And while there isn't a specific command to join a local church, we see that described from the very beginning of the church all the way through the end of the New Testament. It's what people very naturally did. Over and over and over, committing themselves to the local church. As a matter of fact, the church at Jerusalem here, um, they took roll. They knew there were 3,000 in one day and more were being added the next day. They were counting. They knew those that belonged to the church and ultimately those that didn't. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, the apostle Paul has written to the church at Corinth. And he's given them very specific instructions. Now, these were not instructions for everyone in every place and at every time, but for this particular local church and those at Galatia. Here's what it says. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also you are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside, uh, put aside and store it up, um, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredited by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And so Paul, believing that there was a specific group of believers in a specific place who existed at a specific time, he says, hey, church at Corinth, I want you guys to, to bring stuff in on the first day of the week, set it aside. There are people in Jerusalem who are in need, and I'm going to swing by there, whoever I might send, and they're going to gather it and take it to the saints in the church at Jerusalem. Now, that specific directive was not for every church in every place at every time. It was to a very specific local church, those in Galatia and this one at Corinth. Now, if everyone, everywhere, if the church is merely just this amorphous blob of people somewhere around the globe and none of us have any responsibility to be devoted to a local group of believers, to whom was Paul writing? Because I'm guessing if every church everywhere would have read this, they would have thought, okay, we've got to take up this thing on the first day of the week, which there's nothing wrong with. But Paul would not have shown up, right? No one would have taken it to Jerusalem. and would be like, is Paul a liar? What's happening? Obviously, Paul believed that believers existed in identifiable groups in specific places at specific times. They were committed together, and they were ultimately going to obey his instruction together as a local body. We see it again in Acts chapter 18, verse 27. 
and really uh, all throughout the scriptures we see where believers would, maybe they got a new job or they'd move from one city to the other, and they would write letters from their local church to a different local church saying, hey, receive these brothers and sisters. They're very faithful in the gospel. Receive them as a part of your local church. And so we have the example of the early church. This is what they did. They committed themselves together. They were an identifiable body of local believers who participated in the ordinances together, who sat under discipline together, who, who were a body who were committed to one another. So we have the example of the early church. The second reason I would give you for why you should join this or another local church is the existence of church government. I know, riveting. Yes, I know, you're excited. Um, Here's the thing. God has ordained leaders in every sphere of our lives, in our home, in our government, and in the church. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And he said, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist incur judgment. Can I remind you of what was going on when Paul wrote this letter? A few weeks ago, we talked about the emperor Nero and his brutal treatment of Christians. And right after Nero, there was Domitian, who may have been even more brutal than Nero was before him. And yet the apostle Paul says, listen, church, you should obey your authorities. Like authority structures have been instituted by God. And until they call you to break God's law or to disobey God's law, you should obey them. They're there for your good. And he doesn't just do it in government, but he also does it in the church. And the, the writer of Hebrews, writing to Hebrew Christians in chapter 13, verse 17, he writes and he says this to Christians, obey your leaders. Now this is in the context of the church, not governmentally, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those whom you will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And so the Apostle Paul, the writer of Hebrews, both understand that God has implemented authorities in our lives. He's done it in our homes, he's done it in our government, and he's done it in the church. Now, if there is no such thing as a specific, identifiable, local body of believers that we have um, covenanted together with, I would ask the question, who is the writer of Hebrews talking about here? I mean, I think there's almost 40 churches just in the city of Poto. Which believers are you supposed to obey? If you're going to be obedient to the scriptures here, which ones are you going to obey if you're not identified with a specific body of believers? And then to those who are leaders in churches, whose souls are they watching over? Is it everybody in the whole city of Poto? Should we expand out to Little Four County? Is it everyone in the world, right? I believe what the scripture would show us is that there are local bodies of believers who gather together and covenant together and say, we are a local church. These are our leaders and we are the people in this body. We're going to commit ourselves together on behalf of one another for the fulfilling of the Great Commission, for observing the ordinances, for encouraging one another, and to listen and sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word. If there was no such thing as church membership, again, how would we know what leaders we're supposed to obey? And how would the leaders know the people that they were ultimately responsible for? So I've given you the example of the early church. I've given you the existence of church government. And the third one, I, it, it gets better as we go here, is this. The exercise of church discipline. Now, when I say church discipline, you might think of the Catholic Church and someone getting excommunicated for whatever offense, right? Uh, that would be an exercise of church discipline. But let me, let me show you that in, in the Scriptures. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, this is Jesus talking about someone who will be found to be in sin and how we as a church should ultimately deal with them. Here's what he says. In Matthew 18, verse 15, he says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. When you see somebody who's gone off the path, like they're obviously, it's demonstrably sinful, something's going wrong, this is not nitpick anything everyone's ever done, uh, but clearly when you see someone establishing a pattern of sin in their life, they've clearly sinned against you, you should go and tell them his fault. 
To be honest with you, this is church discipline at its finest, where we have come together as a group of believers with one mind and one spirit, and we're striving together for the faith of the gospel. And it ain't easy, right, to live a life of faithfulness before God. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to fall into sin. And Jesus is saying, when someone does this and you see it, the way this should begin is that one of you goes to that person, and in private you gather him up and you say, hey, listen, I see this thing in your life. You're, you're drinking way too much. Or you're neglecting your family. Or the way that you talked to me wasn't acceptable. And the hope every single time one of these conversations happens with someone who's in your church is that you say, you know what? You're right. I mean, the word's true. And I'm, I'm drinking too much. And I'm not spending the time with my family or whatever that thing might be. Man, I want to turn away from that. Would you pray for me right now that I could be healed and I could be the kind of man that God's called me to be? Like, that's how church discipline should happen the vast majority of the time. But Jesus knew that we're kind of stubborn, right? I don't know what you are, but I'm a little stubborn, and I don't always hear. And so he says, if the person doesn't repent, if we continue on, verse 16, if he doesn't listen, you should take one or two others along with you that the matter might be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So... If I didn't repent when you confronted me about whatever you might have seen in my life, you should go not go spread it, not you know post it on Facebook, none of that stuff. But rather, you go speak to some other people who love me and are committed to me and say, hey, have you seen this in Jason's life? And then two or three of you come. Hey, it wasn't just her who saw this. It wasn't just me. Like We've seen this as a pattern in your life, and it's destructive. And we're committed to striving together for the faith of the gospel, right? And so we're going to have this conversation again. And hopefully, again, the person will repent and I can be restored and you can pray for me and we can move forward together as a body, right? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. But if they don't, in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, we're supposed to tell it to the church. Now, I submit to you that this isn't broadcasted globally on social media. That this isn't call every person in every place who's ever called themselves a believer, but rather in this local body of believers who have covenanted together, striving together for the faith of the gospel, would say, Jason has a problem. And he's not walking in obedience to the faith. And he's not walking in repentance to that. And the whole church would say, here's what the scripture says. And the hope is that you'll repent and align your life with the word, right? This is, that's what it's supposed to be. And if I don't, here's the instruction from Jesus. If he refuses to listen to him, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. That collectively, we as a body would say to the person who persists in sin, whatever that thing may be, you're no longer a part of us. Not only are you not a part of this church, we're saying we don't believe you belong to Christ because you're not willing to submit to him in your life. Now, hopefully... I've heard this described as church discipline ought to be the period at the end of a very long sentence. Uh, we're not eager to kick people out of our church. Uh, if if y'all were eager, I'd have been kicked out a long time ago, right? What we want to see is a body who are committed to one another. And then we lock arms together and we strive together for the faith of the gospel. This is what Jesus taught us to do. We see it demonstrated in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. It was likely that this man was sleeping with his stepmom. He says, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now, question again. If there is no local church that people belong to, what were they removed from? If people had not first been included in some sort of membership in the church of Corinth, what were they removed from? What did they boot them out of and say to them, hey, you're not a part of us? I believe that God has called us as believers to covenant together, to commit ourselves to a local church in an identifiable way such that when the church would speak to us, we would listen. If we're found to be in sin, that we would own that, right? We would feel the weight of the church and we would repent. And we would follow the teachings of Jesus in our life, even when it doesn't feel right to us, or even when it's difficult for us to walk through that. 
So I've given you the example of the early church, the existence of church government, the exercise of church discipline, and the final thing I want to share with you today is the call throughout Scripture for mutual edification. Edification, by the way, if you don't know what that means, it's one of those big biblical words. Um, It's used for how we encourage one another and build one another up in Christ. In Philippians 1.27, where we started, the Apostle Paul, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. When someone falls down, you're right there to pick them up. When someone needs to be encouraged, you're using your gifts to encourage one another. This isn't something that you attend once a week and then you go home, but this is a body that you commit yourselves to, that when someone is hurting, we hurt right alongside them. And when someone rejoices, we get to rejoice with them. That we don't show up like last minute to, to roll into a seat to sit for hopefully only about an hour, and then we're gone for the rest of the week, but this is a body of people that we are committed to. And we give our lives to this because what we understand is that God has not called believers to live lives somewhere out on their own, but he's called us to gather together as a body, to lock arms together and to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, he says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's various grace. Whoever speaks should speak as one speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There are more than 41 and others throughout Scripture that you cannot fulfill if you're all alone. But rather in the context of a local church who gathers. We love one another. And we serve one another. And we teach one another. And we admonish one another. We bear with one another. We serve one another. So why should you become a member of a local church, this or some other local church? Because we see in Scripture the example of the local church, the existence of church government, the exercise of church discipline, and the call to mutual edification. Rather than being like T-ballers who like prefer unstructured play, but really never accomplish anything meaningful, we would choose to come together as the church of Jesus Christ, with Jesus as our King, and we would join together with one mind and one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel, to make disciples both of each other and of those who are around us. So specifically today, I'm going to ask every single one of you, and I mean every single person who is here, if you've been here for very long at all, to seriously pray through and weigh what the scriptures have to say about you becoming a visible, identifiable member of this local body of believers. We call it covenant membership here. And we covenant together to say we're going to pursue Jesus as individuals and we're going to be faithfully here to pursue Jesus together as well. We ask you to join this body of believers in covenant with us, to use your gifts to build up the body, that you be faithful, that if you're called on, you'd be eager to serve Now, if you're here and you're like, I'm ready to do this. I've been wanting to be a member for a while. Uh, On January 15th, we have our Discover Cross Community class where we're going to go through our doctrine, uh, our leadership structure, everything you've ever wanted to know about Cross Community Church in one class, and we feed you a meal, right? So if you're interested in that, uh, when we're done here today, you can go to the Welcome Center and they'll sign you up there. Or you can do it via the app. Go to Church Center, find Cross Community, sign up. Again, be there and, and covenant together with us. If you're already a member of this body, you've already filled out a covenant membership form, you don't have to fill out a form again this year, except we're going to send you an email on January the 2nd, and it's basically going to be the covenant. You can read through what you're covenanting to do with us, but we want you to say, I'm a part of this local body, and I'm going to serve here. I'm going to join arms with everyone else, and we're going to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Now, if you have questions... Maybe you're here and you have issues with us doctrinally. You're not sure what we believe. Again, discover should walk through all those things. But if you have ongoing concerns about our doctrine, we have five elders that would love to visit with you at any time. My email's on the church website. You can find Gary Jordan, Craig Marquardt, Wayne Hoffman, Matt Duke is at our Pecola campus. And we would love to sit down with you and, and look into the scriptures about our doctrine. But there's one other reservation you might have about joining a local church. And maybe for you... You just don't feel like you can trust our leadership. 
Maybe you're like, you know, I think those guys are shady. I don't like the way they do things, whatever. Here, here's what I would say to you as lovingly as I possibly can. It's okay. We would bless you to go out and find a local church that preaches and teaches the word of God faithfully and that has leaders that you trust. But whether you do it here or you do it somewhere else, and don't, don't continue to flap in the wind to be out on your own, but find a church and become a visible member, join together in covenant with them to be the church of Jesus Christ. Rather than playing as a bunch of disconnected people all pursuing our own ends, come together with a body of, of believers, one mind, one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Would you bow with me? Father, we do thank you that you've given us a local church. God, through some of the most trying times of my life, there have been men and women who have walked with me when I was a young man, people you brought into my life to encourage me and teach me. Lord, I had the joy of growing up here together and benefiting from so many men and women who invested who chose to, rather than maybe have an extra day off on Sunday or stay at home and, and take it easy, they came here and they taught classes and they cleaned the building and they invested in young people. God, I praise you for that. And I pray that you would unite us together in that same way that you did these early churches we've seen. One mind, one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Lord, for the men and women who are here, I pray that they may be strengthened when we gather. We might use our gifts to build one another up. And Lord, I pray that we would follow you wherever you might lead us. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.